So do you want to actually build stuff? I've been noticing in a lot of the videos I've been making that I kind of just gloss over how you put stuff together. But I'm going to be working on a project soon and I thought I'd document my process for taking mechanical engineering and making real world products and parts. Now that might include 3D printing and I know there's a thousand tutorials out there on 3D printing, but I wanted to show how I do it and the workflow I use using sound engineering principles. Now, when you're modeling in the computer, in the real world, say as an engineering job, you'll use um, SolidWorks, or there's other softwares called ProEngineer or Onshape, and these are $3,000 a piece. It's just a lot of money to buy these softwares. So I know how those softwares work, and I use them in my job, but I don't necessarily have enough money to use them at home. So I've scoured the internet and looked at several tools that allow me the same flexibility and functionality as those expensive tools, but using open source. So I'm going to show you how to make real world objects and I'm going to be using this small project I'm making to show you how to make 3D printed parts and a real product using the same workflow you'd use if you were doing it professionally for a living. Back in the late 90s, I used to work for a company that made mining equipment. These were large loaders that would pull large chunks of dirt and move it around underground in mine shafts. In my lunch hour, I even took the hand drawings of this vehicle and modeled them all in the computer from the ground up. A mechanical engineer will use a thing called a parametric modeler to put its design into a computer and make it easy to change later. So he starts with this blue box called Design Intent and creates his design or model with the intent. Then later he comes in and adds build instructions. Now the Design Intent's goal is to know that the design works and make it easy to modify later. Whereas the build instructions are the final product for a mechanical engineer, that would be the mechanical drawing that tells them how to build it. The goal is to make sure the design can be made and it's easy to build. Now, this may not make any sense to you, so let's do a concrete example of how this works. Let's say, for instance, you want to make something fun with your kids, like an arcade game or something. And you picture yourself in front of this large arcade playing it comfortably. And you have a few ideas in your head. You want the game controller and the buttons to be about this big. And you want to know, you want it to be the right height. So then you think, well, what is the right height? So you stand up and you hold your hands about this high, about where you'd want to hold the joystick and press the buttons. So then you take a tape measure and you measure from your hand all the way down to the floor. And you take that distance and you know that's about the distance you want your hands to be holding when you grab the joystick. Well now I have my requirements for my arcade. I know what I want to do but how do I make something that actually does it? Well, let me show you. So here's the design of our arcade. We have all the dimensions that drive the design. This 1,092 millimeters is the distance from the floor to my hands, so they'll rest comfortably on this plate, and I need 10 inches of space, which is 254 millimeters. And the rest of the constraints are done for aesthetics and what, what I wanted the side of the arcade to look like. Now if you go over and look at this page, this is all the dimensions that you would use to build the arcade. So if you go out to your garage and you lay out the piece of plywood, you can pull a tape measure from this baseline and from this line and find all these points and tape them out and then cut them with a jigsaw and you have the side of your arcade. This is your build view that shows you how to build it and this is your design view. So let's say I wanted to change this design to work for a smaller person, say a child. I would come into the dimension that I made made for my hands from the floor and I would change it to a shorter dimension. I say OK and now I've got a, a smaller arcade if I close this and go over to the new page, now all of my dimensions have changed to make the shorter arcade for a shorter person, say a child. 
So we're not actually going to design an arcade, but I wanted to explain to you what parametric means. It means that the design drives the output and you can easily change the design and everything outside of it is driven by that design. Whenever you're modeling for engineering or anything you're trying to do, it's always good to have this setup and workflow. What do you think? <laughs> so this is FreeCAD. It's a open source parametric modeler. Now it doesn't do everything perfectly. It doesn't allow you to assemble parts together. It has some unreleased modules that do and there are several different versions that are confusing, but I don't recommend it for assembly at this point, but it's parametric modeling of parts is outstanding. It's at least as good as some of the very expensive ones out there. And the developers deserve a lot of credit because they've been at this for years trying to make this tool. But basically, if, when you create a part, you can create a new part inside of FreeCAD. And inside of here, you have to go to the part designer. And inside, after you've gone into part design, you create a body, which is a container for your object you want to create and you can create a sketch and when you're creating a sketch you need to select a plane to create the sketch on so you click on the sketch uh, plane you want to do that on and then you go into the sketch and then there's two sets of tools up here here's your geometry tools right here and this is your constraint tools so let's say we want to make a box now most people when they're modeling uh, in a parametric model or come down here and they select this point and it'll automatically create a constraint that puts a box starting at that point and then you click outside of here and notice how the object is white. Um, basically that means it is under constraint and here's all the constraints it made already. These two lines are vertical, these are, par are horizontal and these points are connected to the lines and those types of things. I can actually drag this box around, but I can't drag this corner around because it made a constraint that put the two dots on top of each other. So if I want to start constraining this, I have to add a constraint to these things. And I can also add um, dimensions or different things like that onto here. But so if I want to vertically dimension that, I come over here and I create a vertical dimension on here and I'll say that's five. Okay, now give me a minute here to explain why everything I just did is not best practice when you're parametric modeling. Now, notice if I wanted this to be square, I make it five millimeters and now it's a five millimeter square with the dot centered in the lower left corner. When I'm modeling, this is not the way you want to do it. What you want to do is you want to say, well, I, I know that this thing is square. I don't want two dimensions to make it square. So I'm going to select this whole thing and I'm going to delete it. And I'm going to start over. And basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw another box, but this time I'm going to put the box with my X and Y planes in the center. Now these X and Y planes are very handy uh, later on and you always want to leave all of your planes in the center of your part. Let's say I wanted to put four holes into this box and I wanted them to be symmetrical around the center of the part. If I left it the way it was and this point was down in the corner, I would have no reference for the center of the part. So you want your center planes or your center axes to go through the center of your part. So it's worth the extra effort to take some time to achieve this. So the way you do this is you use symmetric constraints. So if I select this dot, I hold the shift key down, I select this dot, and I select this dot, then when I go up here to a symmetric constraint, I click on it, and it makes these two, now my box is centered in the y, around the Y axis, I can click on, well, click out, click on this dot, click on this axis, and this dot, and now 
I make another symmetrical constraint, and now I am symmetrical, and from now on, I've kept this center origin dot in the center of my part. And keeping these planes in the center of your part is key to future happiness while you're, while you're trying to create a part. Looks like I have some redundant constraints on here, so I click on this, and I delete those, and now I don't have any more redundant constraints. And now I wanna dimension it, but what I wanna do is I go, okay, well, I'll make a vertical dimension, and I'll say it's going to be five millimeters, but now I want this to be a box, so what I do is I select this line and this line, and I make them equal. Now my box is fully constrained and I only have one dimension to change and I don't have to mistype it once and now it's not exactly a correct square box. I know that my design wants to be a square box. So, and I made it five millimeter, I close this and now I'm going to actually decide what I wanna do with that sketch and I can pad it out and I wanna make it five millimeters and I say, okay. So I've just now created a default cube, but I did the same mistake again. So I padded the object, but if we turn on by hitting the spacebar, we can toggle visibility, our XY planes, we can see that again, I've aligned one of the faces with the bottom edge. Now if I wanna use this edge to create a sketch, I can click on this face down here and click on it. So having this plane, our geometry reference plane, and this plane in the same uh, place does us no good. We really want to have this plane in the middle of the part. And that way we can make holes in the center of our part or make changes and our planes are always in the center of the part. I can't stress how important it is to do this. So. To achieve this, we go back to our pad that we did, and we say it's a dimension five millimeters, but we say symmetric to plane. And now we say okay, and our part is centered with the planes in the center of it. So now if I wanna make a hole, I can click on a face, I can create a new sketch, and I can now come up here draw a circle off the center dot and if I dimension this circle with a radius and I say oh, okay that's gonna be two millimeters then I say okay close we're gonna create a pocket and it goes through the, the part but instead of dimensioning it we're gonna go through all and we say okay and we didn't have to dimension our circle because we placed our planes always in the center of our part. So now that we've done this, we can go back and we can go to our pocket, wrong sketch, we go to this sketch, and we can modify this dimension to be one millimeter, and then we close it, and now our hole is smaller. So it's a non-destructive, parameter-driven, parametric modeling way of making models quickly that are dimensionally accurate. That's the power of FreeCAD and it has some advantages and some disadvantages over Blender. So let's talk for a minute about modeling for in Blender. This is a linear rail I purchased off of Amazon for I don't remember how much, $100 or so, and it has a race on it and a bearing that runs back and forth and I want to build something that uses this particular part. So we're going to model this in FreeCAD or at least show how it's done. So I took the bearing race linear rail carriage off of the rail and I pulled out my calipers and I started measuring it. So the first thing I did was I measured its profile and made dimensions and put the whole thing together as a single sketch. After I'd completed the sketch I notice that I placed the, the planes in the middle of the part again for easy use. And from there, I started filleting the edges. I created a pocket that put all the four holes in the top for the bolts, 
put another set of filters on there, put a pocket for the center hole, another pocket for the through hole, and I added a chamfer around the hole, a couple more chamfers, and now I have my part, and it's all dimensionally accurate, and I sat here with my calipers and did it. From here, we can actually go File, Export, and I can choose the STL file format and name it whatever I want to call it. I'll call it Test Out, and I hit Save, and now I can bring it into Blender. So this is Blender. It's really flexible and does a great job, but it has a few drawbacks. Its, it's strengths are actually its weaknesses. If you go into edit mode on a part and you delete a face, Blender allows you to create what's called a non-manifold mesh. If I were to 3D print or create this part, I couldn't actually do it in the real world because notice the wall thickness is zero. So how does, if I were to send this to a 3D printer, how would it know where to print? Um, it would maybe print in the side a little bit or it wouldn't know what to do. So it's very easy in Blender to make a uh, mesh that doesn't really hold water, so to speak, literally. You, you, you might think of putting water in here, but if it were on its side um, like this, the water would all drain out because you don't know where the inside and the outside of the part are. So. The other problem with Blender is just with one click of the key and the move of the mouse and a click again, I've just destroyed all dimensional accuracy for this part. I have no idea what dimension this part is. So Blender's not really that great for making parts that you want to be dimensionally accurate, like you know exactly what it is. What it is really good at though is making assemblies of lots of parts and Actually, creating 3D parts in Blender is incredibly fast, 3D printed parts, um, because you don't have to dimension them. You, you just create the part, you make sure it's manifold, and you can send it to a printer, and it works well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to import the file that we did previously, and that is the um, that is this test out file. So this is the one that we modeled in FreeCAD. And this is manifold because Blender or uh, FreeCAD does not allow you to make a part that is non-manifold. So I'm going to rotate in the X and I'm going to do it 90 degrees. And now this part is dimensionally accurate in, in Blender. And I can make other parts that mate with this one and 3D print them out and they will mechanically fit. Because I use the STL import, when I use the STL export, it'll go to my slicer and be the correct scale. So we're going to go ahead and I'll show you some bigger assemblies that we've done in, in Blender and to make 3D printed parts and some assemblies um, that worked well. So here I've modeled the le linear rail and basically I did it by modeling a circle and then I went after the circle and added the base of the circle in and from there I went ahead and added the holes and chamfered the holes on the linear rail in the distances and diameters that belong. So this isn't a blender modeling tutorial but you can use this accurate geometry to then model 3D printed parts from here that mate to this linear rail. Often what I'll do to start is go into edit mode on the FreeCAD geometry I've imported and I'll duplicate the parts that I want to be in my 3D print and then I'll separate by selection those that geometry to start my part that I'll then model my 3D printed part off of. Since I'm not going to be showing you all of that, I just kind of want to show you the workflow and then you can look at other Blender tutorials on how to model a part that's worthy of 3D printing. So here you can see I'm actually duplicating part of the modeled FreeCAD race and moving it to another part. And then I can model the geometry that I'm going to 3D print that mates with the FreeCAD part and extrude it and turn it into a 3D printable block or part that I will later then print on the printer to interface with these real world objects. 
So this is a large, very large 3D printer that I designed and built a little while ago using this workflow. All of the parts that are ordered off the web have been modeled. And the part I have selected here is the one that I designed to be 3D printed between all of the ordered parts that were designed in free, or they weren't designed in FreeCAD, but they were modeled uh, the way I've just shown you in FreeCAD. And if I want to make changes to this part, it's very quick and easy in Blender. If I want to make this pad thicker, I can just grab that section and I can uh, move it in the Z. And this way I can print out a lot of them, print one or two out, try them, go into Blender, change it again and again. And I don't really have any dimensions and I don't have anything slowing me down. And so most of the parts that you see here um, were actually 3D printed on a small 3D printer to make this larger one. And I could assemble them all together and see that they fit and even assemble uh, or put all the bolts in and make sure that the, the nuts fit and everything worked properly. And I had a working assembly. So here the printer is fully built after having been modeled in FreeCAD and assembled in Blender. Here's that part you saw that we looked at inside of Blender, 3D printed and on the printer itself. All the white parts were modeled in the same way as well. This methodology works really well for doing any project you want to do, and a lot of times it's already been done on the internet. For instance, the code for this printer I got from Marlin, basically it's the open source and on the internet, and you just tweak it to work for your printer. But a lot of these projects have been done, but maybe not the way you want to do it. I wanted a really, really large format printer. This thing's got a two foot by three foot by five foot print size, so I can print out a full human being with it. And that was just something that I wanted to do, so I went ahead and used this methodology. Here I'm printing a, a model from Thingiverse that's a big castle and um, looks good, but if you're interested in this printer, I put it in open builds. I'll put the link in the description, and you can build this printer if you'd like. But I wanted to show you how I model 3D parts and turn them into real-world projects. So you guys had a better insight as to how I'm making things when I show you a part in my other tutorials and how you can do it yourself.